Here was a certain man's prayer. It says this. Here's the poem. I knelt down to pray when day was done and prayed, O oh Lord, bless everyone. Lift from each saddened heart the pain and let the sick be well again. And then I woke another day and carelessly went on my way. The whole day long I did not try to wipe a tear from any eye. I did not try to share the load of any brother on the road. I didn't even go to see the sick man next door to me. Yet once again when day was done, I prayed, O oh Lord, bless everyone. But as I prayed, I heard a thought. Please, hypocrite, before you pray, whom have you tried to bless today? God's sweetest blessings always go by hands that serve Him here below. And then I hid my face and cried, Forgive me, God, for I have lied. But let me live another day, and I will live the way I pray. Brethren, it is... That the way that we pray and then live. Do we pray for, for one thing and then for us to live one way, to act one way, and then we live in the total opposite way in which we pray? At the end of the day, when we lay our heads down at night, do our lives really show the way that we talk to God? This morning, may we examine our lives. When, when looking at this question that's been asked so many times, what is our life? What is life? We can consider how Moses said, again, it's not a vain thing. It's not a pointless thing. He says, for this is your life, that you learn the words of God. In other words, that, that you know what God wants you to know and that you do them. You do the things that God wants you to do. And Moses had the task before him to get Israel to know the words of God's law. He said, it is your life to do this, to know God's law. And it was a very important thing for them to do then. And so how important it would also be for us to do the very same thing today. As we examine our lives, as we examine our hearts this morning, can it be said that, that we truly love the Lord with, with everything? Matthew 22 and verse 37, Jesus said unto them that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, with all of thy mind. Or would it be said about our lives, would our hearts be described this way by Jesus as he described those in Matthew 15 and verse 8? that this people, they, they draw nigh unto me with their mouth. They, they honoreth me with their lips, but their heart, their heart is far from me. This morning, would you imagine with me that your life or that your heart is a house? And in this house, there, there are several different rooms and each room represents a different aspect of Christian living. This morning, let's inspect the house of our hearts together to determine whether or not we're living the way that we pray, to determine whether our hearts, are they near to God or are they far from God? Number one, let's look in the revival room. The revival room is what we can call it. Let's say as we make our way through the house of our heart, we, we come to this very first room, the revival room, and, and above the door, imagine we can see written above that door, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, where Jesus said, and He came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Brethren, we can see that God has given specific marching orders, if you will, and how important it would be for us to abide faithfully to the things that are commanded of us. Perhaps it is this room in the heart that we can remember every sermon that we've ever heard preach. And maybe we can remember how, how we have let little things hinder our obedience to God. It would be in this room of our hearts that we can remember the times that we've disobeyed God when His Word was in our heart, but yet we still did not walk in the way that He would have us to walk. What comes to your mind when in this revival room of your heart? In other words, what truly motivates you to, to spread the gospel? What truly motivates you to, to share the word of God with others? Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 15, He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Oh, I, I think about how, how there are many souls who are lost in in this community, in this county, in this, in this state, and in the world. And what am I doing to help bring souls to Christ? I think about how, how many congregations of the Lord's church all over the world, they may be struggling to keep the doors open. I think about how the truth of God's Word is not upheld like it should be in many places. Places that claim to uphold truth and righteousness. I think about how so many in the world today, perhaps they have become distracted due to materialism, due to selfishness. When I examine my life, when I examine myself in this room, this revival room, I cannot help but consider how I measure up when it comes to the Great Commission that we are to uphold. I think about how many times I've, I've come to worship and how I've never asked anyone to join me. As one being concerned for the souls of other men, how could we neglect the opportunity uh, for them to hear the truth of God's Word? The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12. It's inspired by our holy and almighty God, and it's profitable, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. It contains everything pertaining to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1.3. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Psalm 119, 105. It's settled in heaven. Psalm 119 and verse 89. How could we neglect an opportunity to share the truth, to share the Word of God with others, and perhaps we may sing the songs, Lead me to some soul today, or almost persuaded, and we may have a, a particular individual in mind, but maybe we don't really do anything to help them come to Christ. Friends, when it comes to this revival room of our hearts, may we remember it's so much more. It's so much more than just knowing about the lost. But we are to consider what are we doing to help bring the lost to Christ. We have the revival room. But secondly, let's go to room number two. Room number two would be the book room. The book room. So we're continuing through the, walking through the, the house of our hearts this morning and, and we come to, to the book room and, and perhaps when we look above the door we would see 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 where Paul told Timothy to study, study to show thyself approved unto God, a, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, how important it would be for us, friends, to, to spend some time in the book room. 
You know, we may read many books written by ordinary authors. We may watch certain TV shows or, or certain movies. We may listen to, to all kinds of different music on the radio or, or on our phones or wherever it may be. But how much time do we really spend in study of God's Word? You know, it's interesting to see at times how, how so many people, they can share great details about their favorite actor. And they can, they can know the life story of their favorite musician. And, and they can study and know their entire life. But if we were to ask the question, how much time do you spend studying the Bible? Brethren, would we be ashamed? Would we be ashamed to answer that question? Maybe even think about this past week with me. Would we be ashamed at, at how many times we picked up our Bibles and studied them aside from the times that we met together for our gospel meeting? Could we say that, that we have the Word of God in our hearts and in our minds? David said on one occasion in Psalm 119 and verse 11, that thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Friends, there is so much to learn. There is so much to do. And, and how sad it is to see that, that so many spend so little time learning what they need to do. Perhaps that is why there is so much, we could say, spiritual ignorance in the religious world today and, and maybe at times even in the church. We don't really learn what we ought to be doing and, and we don't study. Let, let's ponder this question together. I, I once heard a, an older preacher ask the question, is the reason why so many people don't want to teach or preach the Word of God would it be because of their lack of Bible knowledge? And if so, are they doing anything to fix it? Or, or, or do they know that, that if they commit to, to teaching or preaching or proclaiming the Word of God, that it will take time and study, and they just simply don't want to do that? Peter said in 2 Peter 3.18 that we are to grow. He says grow in the grace of and in the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. It has been said that preparation brings about self-confidence and how important then it would be to be prepared when, when it comes to, to teaching the Word of God to someone, when, when proclaiming the Word of God, when, when studying the Word of God with someone. It's truly a blessing to take time and to sit down and study the Bible. I would dare say that, that if we all uh, sat down and studied the Bible, we wouldn't walk away with the mindset that we've wasted time. We wouldn't walk away that, that we didn't get anything out of it. It's so such a blessing to study the Word of God and how sad it is to see those who are simply too busy too busy to study the Bible. And that, my friends, is, is what brings about spiritual ignorance. I wonder this morning how, how many could recite the lyrics to their favorite song but not be able to recite the gospel plan of salvation. How many would be able to share their favorite line in their favorite movie but not be able to recite the books of the Bible? How many would be able to give a detailed account of a particular series of movies but, but not be able to tell the general theme of the Bible? Friends and brethren, this morning we need to learn to study and to love to study the Word of God. Psalm 119 and verse 9 says, Wherewith shall a, shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You know, preachers at times may neglect the, the teaching of fundamental topics. And it may be the case that some say, well, he preaches the plan, but, but not the man. Well, the fact of it all is, is that you cannot preach the plan without the man, but the plan is plain, and the plan must be taught. And so how important would it be for us, friends, to get back to the Bible 
to preach and to teach and to look at the fundamentals that we so desperately need. Isaiah 40 and verse 8 says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord shall stand forever. The word of our God shall stand forever. Friends, that means it's reliable. It's truth. We can depend upon it. You, you know, many people at times, they, they may brag about a certain religious group knocking on their front door and, and not letting them in to their home. But perhaps do you think that it may be the case in many situations that, that we may not let them into our homes due to our lack of Bible knowledge? Could it be the case that, that we don't defend the truth because we may be afraid that they might know more about the Bible than we do? Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15 to, to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and with fear. One preacher said that we can't pull the wool over God's back. Friends, He knows our hobbies. He knows what we deem important in our lives. And so may we be a people who, who, let the, who lets the Word of God guide our lives, who lets the Word of God enrich our lives. And may it never be said of us that, that we're not true students of God's Word. The book room. We, we go to, we went to the book room. Now let's look to the next room, which would be the word room. The word room. So we're journeying through the, the house of our hearts this morning. And, and as we're going down through the hall of our house, and maybe we look at the, the next room, and, and we look above that door of the word room, and we see Psalm 19 and verse 14 where the Bible says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In other words, let everything within me be based on what I know about God. This is the room perhaps where, where we remember every conversation that we've had with others about God and His Word. Have our conversations with others, have they, have, do they cause, do our conversations with other people cause them to see that we glorify God in, in our own lives? Psalm 34 and verse 15 says that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. In fact, the eyes of the Lord are never closed to what we do, to what we know, to what we study, to what we show interest in. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so knowing all of these things, would that make us ashamed by how we use our words, by how we speak to others? Would this make us ashamed of, of perhaps how we, how we have spoken to our family or, or, or what if a, a recording was, was taken of how we speak to others? What if other people knew and saw and heard the way that, that you speak to those that we're to honor and love and respect? Would we be ashamed? We lose ourselves in certain situations, but, but how important would it be to always make it right? You know, it has been said that we may be dog tired on Sunday because we're growling around the house all week. And while that may have some truth to it, but it ought not to be true when it comes to our homes. Friends, now more than ever, we need harmony and love in our homes, even when under stress and pressure. The shouting and the nagging and the fussing and the fighting, it does nothing but harm our influence in the home. Paul says to let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. He also said in Ephesians 4 and verse 29 to, to let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, 
that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Who are we edifying with our speech? How are we speaking with others? Does our speech measure up to, to edification? Do we say good things to others and do we build them up instead of tearing them down? Husbands, how would you like to hear your words in the place of your wife? Or wives, how would you like to hear your words if you were in the place of your husband? Or how would you like to hear your words if, if you were in the place of your children? You see, brethren, it can be so easy to hurt our influence in our own homes, even behind closed doors. But, but what about the filthy words that, that, you, that are used in the world today? What about the obscene language that we may see and hear uh, others use in the world today? Could it be said that, that we abstain from that type of language and that type of speech? Oh, we may say, I, I would never do that, or I would never say that as a Christian. But friends, we must be careful about what we say, because we just might, depending on who we associate ourselves with. What about the dirty jokes that, that may be said or that may be laughed at? Do, do we abstain from them? Or what about the euphemisms that, that we may use to try to soften down other words? When we say things such as gosh and golly and darn and dang and, and heck, the list could go on and on. And we might even add how important it would be to, to never take God's name in vain. Brethren, we are to respect that which is holy and reverent. And using God's name outside of that context is disrespectful. We should never try to soften down stronger words. Use them in our vocabulary. Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 11 that it's not that which goeth into the mouth that defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defiles a man. The Proverbs writer said in Proverbs 21, verse 23, that whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from trouble. The word room. What about the action room of our hearts? The action room. As we, make, as we make our way towards the end of the house of our heart, we, we come across the, the action room where above it we might see 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. And, and listen with me carefully to what Paul wrote here. He says, You are our epistle written in our hearts, and he says, Known and read of all men. Known and read of all men. Can you imagine others looking at you and asking, Is that person a Christian? What would the answer to that question be? Would it be, Oh, yes, they're a Christian. I see the way they live. I see the way they talk. They're a child of God by the way that they conduct themselves. Or would the answer be, Surely they don't claim to be a Christian. Surely, surely they don't claim to be a follower of Christ. They don't act like one. Think with me for a moment about how you've lived your life since you've obeyed the gospel. This is what will be found in the action room of your heart. Who has seen Christ in you and who has come to glorify Christ because of you and the way that you live? Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, You let your light so shine before men that, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. How many have done this because of you? I, I'm not asking if, if we haven't made mistakes. We all do and we all will and we all continue will make mistakes. But, but would you say that you failed when it comes to letting your light shine? Maybe you've missed worship when you could have and should have been here. Maybe you've gotten caught up in doing things that you ought not to be doing. Could it be said that, that you've repented and confessed those things and that God has forgiven you? Is that who you are? Or have you been persistent in these actions? Could it be said that you're like that one older elder who said, when I became a Christian... I stopped being dishonest. 
I stopped doing this. I, I stopped doing that. Is that what Christianity has, has done for you? And friends, if not, then, then we've missed the boat. Christianity cleans up our lives. It makes us want to do better, to be better, and, and to exemplify Christ in our lives. But what about when it comes to, to modesty and alcohol and, and drugs and tobacco and vaping and, and pornography and, and other things relating to morality? What do others look? What do they see when they look at your life? We can be reminded of our actions. Paul was talking to the church at Corinth and he was talking about, he lists the, the immorality there in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. And he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous, they, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. And, and he says the same thing in Galatians 5 and verse 21 when, when listing the works of the flesh there. Parents have a great responsibility in, in raising their children. And, and, and I know that I don't sympathize with that responsibility at this time in my life. But friends, Scripture is so clear on the seriousness of this. Ephesians 6 and verse 4, Paul says, You fathers, provoke not your children unto wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And Proverbs 22, 6 says, To train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. Our actions are important. And how important it would be for us to pray and then act like we pray. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember now, the Creator, in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come, nor the years draw nigh, when, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And then in verse 13, he says, Here's the conclusion of the matter, that we ought to fear God. We ought to keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Here's the last room of our hearts this morning. We've made our way through the house of our heart and we've come to our very last door. And that would be the obedient room. The obedient room. And when we look at the door of the obedient room, perhaps we would see Revelation 22 and verse 14 where the Bible says, Blessed are they that do His commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Can you remember this morning when you obeyed the gospel? When, when you were washed and when you were made free and, and when you stood before God pure and clean with, with everything in your life not only forgiven but also forgotten by God. Do you remember the first time that, that you read Acts 2.38 and the impact that it may have had on your life when you realized what you needed to do in order to go to heaven? Within the past couple of years, I've been asked to preach a few different funerals. And when preparing for them, I normally ask myself a few different questions when, when contemplating what I'm going to say about a certain individual. I'll ask myself, what kind of person were they? Were they faithful to the Lord and His church? What kind of life did they live? Did they obey the gospel? Friends, if one were to be preparing for your funeral today and they had to ask themselves these very questions what would the answers be could could, could it be said that that this is your life that you've been faithful that you've stayed true to God that you've kept your promise and that that you're a soldier of the cross could it be said that you were worthwhile in your service to God and that, that you were kind to others could it be said that you never drove souls away from Christ by the way that you live, by the words that you speak, by, by the actions you conduct, but that you always encouraged others to be close to the Lord. What is your life? It's a good question. One that we all would do good to consider this day and every day. James asked it in James 4 and verse 14. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then it vanishes away. Could it be said this morning that there's anything in your life that you're ashamed of? Anything you're not proud of? Could it be said that you have sin in your life this very day? And things that you've done to bring shame upon the church of our Lord? If that's the case, 
why continue living that way? Come repenting of those things and remember that God will remember them no more. This morning, are you a child of God? Are you a Christian? If not, why not, why not obey the gospel today and leave here knowing you're on your way to heaven? Friends, we love you. We want you to go to heaven, but never forget that God loves you. He wants you in heaven for all of eternity. If there's a need that we can help you with this morning, won't you come as together we stand and as we